Hello and welcome to another Beast PC video. So it's 2020 and ITX is all the rage this year. To hop on the trend, we wanted to build something truly unique while still being affordable. Here's what we came up with. First, a few guidelines. Of course, we wanted it to be small, and since we're students, we wanted it to be portable and to fit in a backpack. Second, it should be able to play games, and third, us at the Beast PC team use plenty of Apple products. So ideally, we also wanted it to be a Hackintosh and to be able to run Mac OS. And finally, it should be affordable. With all those criteria, it's amazing we even built a PC at all. We wanted a gaming portable Hackintosh for cheap, but here we are. My gaming portable Hackintosh for cheap. This is the story of building it. Hackintoshes require Intel CPUs for the best support, and since we wanted it to be portable and to fit into a backpack, we decided to go with integrated graphics. Yet, we also wanted to play games. What Intel integrated graphics can play games? Only a very select, forgotten few. Enter this, the Intel Core i5-5675C. Never heard of it? Well, I didn't either. It's from Intel's forgotten 5th generation and has 4 cores and 4 threads and other generic specs, but what really matters is the Iris Pro 6200 graphics. It has double the execution units of modern UHD graphics, meaning it should be twice as fast on paper. Another aspect unique to these CPUs is this, the Level 4 eDRAM cache. It's a fast frame buffer for the integrated GPU, and it also accelerates the CPU in certain tasks like gaming. Combine the good graphics with a good frame buffer and you get a decent integrated graphics solution around as fast as a 2200G, maybe a little bit faster here or there. Unlike that CPU though, this one can run Hackintosh. The motherboard for this generation of processors is Intel's 9 series, so H97 or Z97. The CPU surprisingly has an unlocked multiplier, so we also wanted to be able to overclock a bit and we chose Z97, and of course ITX was necessary too. Finding a Z97 ITX motherboard for an affordable price in this day and age seemed like an impossible task, and my Beast PC colleague told me to just give up. Well, I got lucky and I found this, an ASRock Z97E ITX AC and we somehow negotiated it down to a hundred dollars. Making the cake even sweeter, it came with this Broadcom Wi-Fi, which is required by Hackintosh to work properly and is rather difficult to find. For RAM, I got lucky again and managed to snipe 32 gigabytes of DDR3-2400 for just $77. I truly believe this is one of the luckiest PCs ever built. We use two of these sticks here for 16 gigabytes of blazing fast DDR3 RAM. CPU cooler was an admittedly pretty overpriced ID cooling IS30 I found on Amazon for $25. It's mini ITX and it fits in the case we chose, and it does the job without being terribly loud. However, it has a 100 watt TDP rating, which is appropriate if you live on an Antarctic iceberg. The hardest part of our parts hunt was choosing a case, since popular ITX cases are really expensive and any small ones seem to always be sold out. I managed to find an ITX HTPC system for $80, and I sold off the internals for $100, meaning I could keep the case. As for the case in question, it fits a Flex ATX power supply, and I went on eBay in search for one since these things can power integrated graphics for pretty cheap, and I chose this Enhanced 250 one for $25, and I replaced the fan since it was really loud, all without blowing it up. For storage, well, I happened to have this 128GB SSD on hand, so I used it. It works. Putting the entire PC together wasn't very difficult since this case is just an open box. Let's add a case fan here for extra airflow. 
oh shoot, you can see the CPU core kind of blocks it from going in. Well, I'll use this as an opportunity to teach you guys how to remove wires from a fan header. Uh, simply take the fan header, a thumbtack, push, and voila! Lastly, I added these ridiculous Wi-Fi antennas for a good Wi-Fi signal, and alright, it's complete. Let's power it on, will it work? Yes, yes it does. Let's boot into Windows first, and we're using a lightly modified Windows that we did in-house called Benchmark OS, and let's run the gaming benchmarks. Of course, this is still a gaming hackintosh. I did undervolt the CPU and give the iGPU a tiny overclock for more performance and less heat. In Cinebench R15, we scored nothing special with 589 multi and 148 single. Cinebench R20 might have throttled a few percent but still gave us 1350, although I have seen 1400 points before. At least the CPU won't be a bottleneck for the iGPU, which ran Furmark at around 22 FPS without throttling surprisingly, about half the performance of a GTX 750 Ti. That means the system is more suited to older and easier run games, and let's start with CSGO. The community benchmark map gave us 141 FPS average, which is enough to take advantage of a high refresh rate monitor. GTA 5 ran pretty great as well, 60 FPS or just a little bit below was our average at 720p and low settings, although it would drop to 40 or so in more demanding areas, but the FPS does go up if you look primarily at the floor. Intense physics scenes did not shake the CPU, which is very good. You can even up the resolution to 1080p and play at just over 40 FPS average. I'm not really sure why I tested GTA 4, but it's a fun game and it ran well on this system, although somehow worse than its successor GTA 5. 52 FPS was the average. I played around a fortnight and surprisingly I played pretty well and the computer ran it pretty well as well. Averaging around 85 FPS with the low preset, which was very enjoyable. Doom in OpenGL mode ran okay as well, around 50 FPS average, which is a little bit low for a shooter game, but still playable I guess. More demanding games though didn't fare so well. Metro Exodus, for example, crashed before we could even load into the menu screen. Shadow of the Tomb Raider also crashed. Rise of the Tomb Raider worked though, and it ran surprisingly well with 37 FPS in the benchmark, and more than that in real gameplay. However, The Witcher 3 could not give a playable frame rate at 720p low, only 20 FPS or so. As you could tell, the system is more suited to light and moderate games at lower resolutions. Still, it's very enjoyable when the games do run well. While gaming though, even with the CPU fan maxed and the intake fan providing lots of fresh air, the temperatures could still exceed 90 degrees Celsius. Alright, let's get macOS installed. I followed this guide from a popular hackintoshing forum. First of all, download the Catalina installer on a real Mac, and I use my MacBook Pro that I use as my primary laptop. Then plug in the USB you want to install to by using Disk Utility and showing all devices in Catalina. Then we can go disable System Integrity Protection by restarting, and download Unibeast from their website. This is the installer program that'll write the USB. Run through the installer, clicking through everything, it should be pretty straightforward. I also copied over some things for after install since we won't have internet, including some texts and tools like Clover Configurator. Alright, the USB is done and let's head over to our target computer. First, let's configure the BIOS, make SATA run in AHCI mode, turn on the Intel USB controllers, 
make sure the onboard Wi-Fi is on, and there may be a few other things to configure depending on your system like CSM or graphics, but these settings work for me. Then plug the USB into a USB 2 port and boot to it. Everything's looking good so far. Let's follow the instructions and be patient here, this could take up to a half hour. After everything's done, we are dumped onto the desktop. Our graphics drivers aren't installed though and neither is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Which is nothing a few kecks and a few fixes cannot solve. Let's just paste them into this folder by going to Clover Configurator, Mount EFI, clicking Mount EFI and then opening that folder. Let's configure our graphics as well. And a restart later, we are fully functional. After following this guide to set up iMessage, we got that up and running and we are looking great. Everything works, onboard audio, USB, handoff as you can see here, graphics, iMessage, airdrop, this is essentially a real Mac. Another mission success. Now we just have to see if it lives up to our other expectations. Well, does it fit into a backpack? Yeah, it does. We just gotta remove the antennas though. And finally the price. We tried to stay affordable, but the total came out to around $325 if you include the accessories we bought, like the ridiculously long Wi-Fi antennas for example. Can you beat this in value? Well an alternative is a decent Intel Nook, but those tend to be around $400 and above for graphics comparable to ours although they definitely are way smaller and way more portable. But this build came with a great parts hunt, fun building experience, smooth setup, and most of all an epic story. If you'd stayed to the end of this saga, let me just tell you it was a lot of fun and very satisfying to see it all come together and work perfectly at the end. Thanks for staying by the way. It's something that can game, it can overclock, it can run macOS, and it's portable. I've reached almost perfection, if only it ran games a little bit better. Yet I understand your frustration if you're watching this and you're thinking, well this isn't easily replicable, I was so lucky with my parts and how did I find the case? Well one part of building a PC that you truly want, one that you've worked for is improvisation. You have to find what works for you, what's available for you, and at the end, you'll have something that perfectly suits what you want. Anyways, be sure to stay tuned for more videos featuring this system and more stories about related topics. That's all for today. If you like this video, leave a like and please consider subscribing. See you next time.